So let's start by the elephant in the room, okay? You probably have noticed the molar are getting bigger and bigger. There is a nice graph that uh, Victor San made um, <clears throat> last year, which shows how these models are just getting crazy bigger. It's exponentially increasing. So now the state-of-the-art models, they are over 1 billion parameters, and they're actually far above that because uh, several models are now like 10 billion parameters, like T5 and the Turing model from Microsoft. And you have a huge problem with these models because they don't even fit on one GPU and not even on two GPU. You need like four to eight GPU just to load this model and to run them with a batch size of one. Okay, now why is it a problem? Well, that's a huge problem because if you check like the current leaderboards, for instance, the glue leaderboard that you can see here, you can see that the, the competition is narrowing. Okay, it's all about the same teams now. There's like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Baidu, Facebook, and that's pretty much it. You see, there's no academics there, okay? Because just the models are too big, the, the computational requirements are too big. So there's a, a huge problem of diversity and also where does academia fits in current research in NLP, okay? Another problem that you probably seen is the environmental cost of training small, okay? They require a lot of energy, energy consume and generate carbon dioxide. And so we know that training this model is not good for the environment. What can we do? And the last problem was uh, very well stated by Francois Cholet. It means that if we just go bigger, what do we expect? Do we expect like to see a phase transition at some point? Or is it just like building bigger scales to try to, to reach the moon, okay? Now there is another option, which is to go the other way. We know that since this very nice paper of Yann Lequin, I really like the title, Optimal Brain Damage in 1989, uh, we know that neural nets are over-parameterized. They have too much weights. We can just prune them, and the, the, like, um, the, most recent, the most recent example is the lottery ticket hypothesis, which says that if you take a randomly initialized model, you can actually find a subset inside of these models which already has good, um, good performances on your test task. Okay? You don't even need to train your model. You can just take this big model and find a subset, the small sub-network inside of it that's already nice for your task. And we see that in fine-tuned model as well. When you, when you fine-tune model, you can remove the weights, you can select the weights and you keep the performances. So here you see this example on NLP task, where actually you can remove like 90% of the weights and keep the same performances, okay? So we want to push in this direction. Uh, so here is a small promotion. We, we're doing competition that started actually two days ago, which is about getting the more uh, efficient models that you can, okay? It's called Sustain LP. It's a workshop that we will collect, co collocate it with uh, EMNLP at the end of the year. And the goal is to get this to the same threshold as the current state-of-the-art model, like bird base, for instance, and just to try to be the most efficient, most energy efficient that you can, okay? The competition is only on inference for now because inference is actually one of the, the, the biggest part when you, when you look at the lifetime contribution of a model, like the lifetime computational cost, when these models, they are like um, deployed in application on like thousands of servers, actually inference cost is, is the biggest part of their lifetime environment cost, okay? So if we can get better on inference, we're like already a, a long way through our goal of getting more efficient models. Now, how can you reduce the size of the models, okay? So we start by this. Um, let's go a bit into depth. There are, many, there, are, there are mostly like three techniques that you can use. The first one is called distillation. Second one is pruning, and then there is quantization, okay? So distillation, uh, here is a good example. We made a model called Distilled Bird at the end of last year, which gets uh, like 95 performances of a bird model on glue, and is like 40% smaller. How you do that? Well, you take BERT as a teacher model, which means you have a pre-trained BERT, and then you will train a student model, which will be smaller. And you train the student model to reproduce the generalization capabilities of the teacher, okay? So here is a good example. You see this sentence? Uh, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful, and then the model is uh, asked to complete. So BERT is trained like that. BERT is trained to predict mask token. So here you see the top prediction of birds, and you see they all make sense, okay? You see day, life, future, story, all these top prediction that bird things are, are possible, they all make sense. This is what we call generalization. The model, bird model learn to generalize, okay? Uh, beyond, beyond just a simple training example in this, uh, in this sentence. 
And what we do is that the student's model will be trained to generalize in the same way as the teacher model. So it will learn the inductive bias that the teacher model has learned. It's very easy. We just do a cross entropy. It's called the knowledge distillation. Um, and we just do a cross entropy between um, the output of our students and the output of our teacher okay, when we train. You can use temperature to like emphasize the lower probability. That's very, uh, that's a very common trick in NLP. So now a lot of people have been publishing in, uh, on distillation at the end of last year. Uh, you can see a couple of paper, like the state of the art distillate, distillation models are kind of very complex now. Uh, Tiny Birds is a good example where the student model actually has a smaller size of uh, hidden states and they try to make the, the student model also mimic the hidden states of the, of the teacher. So you have, down, down, you have a down projection from the teacher to the student. They also use a lot of data augmentation, so it's kind of tricky to know exactly what is uh, the good, well, what part of the good performance of this, uh, this latest model come from data augmentation or what part come from distillation, but definitely people can get like very small models with good performances using mix of distillation and data augmentation. Now let's move on to the second technique you can use to reduce the size of the model, okay, which is called pruning. In pruning, you directly work on your teacher model and you actually remove weights from this model to make it smaller. Okay? There are various ways you can prune. And uh, one simple way is actually to remove attention heads in your transformer. It was shown by two, two, two nice papers of last year, one by uh, Elena Boita from Edinburgh University and the other by Paul Michel at, uh, at CMU. And they show that you can actually remove a lot of the heads of transformer model after they've been trained and you can uh, keep very good performances. So on the top, you see the results on translation. You see that you can actually remove um, 90% of the heads and keep a very good blue score. And on the bottom, you see the result on glue, which is the general language understanding benchmark, and you see pretty much the same performance. So uh, one way you can identify the heads you should remove is by using um, what uh, Michel, Paul Michel um, called the score, the, the head importance score, which is actually the, the gradient of the loss with regard to the, to the output of the, of the attention layer. And if you, do, if you remove the, the less important heads first, you can actually keep this very good performance. What is interesting is that you see on, the, on this last graph here is that you can actually, if you remove some heads that are uh, less important for one task, here it's on the MNLI, you can actually see that this, this is quite resilient to domain adaptation. So here in MLLI, you have two parts from the data set. You have what is called the matched data set and the mismatched data set. And if we remove some heads that are not useful for one, you can see that actually it's kind of related. Well, okay, the graph is not exactly linear, but there is some correlation with heads that are not important on another domain, okay? So which means that there are some heads that are actually not useful for anything, at least on MNLI, okay? That's interesting because it means this is quite resilient to domain adaptation. Now, you can also directly remove the weights. Uh, when you remove the weights, um, it's uh, actually more uh, fine-grained because each, the, each specific weight can be removed. But the problem is that you will end up with very sparse matrices that are not so good for, for GPUs. We'll talk about that later. But you can get also very good performances. Here is a nice paper from um, the ASAP team uh, with uh, Jerry Walwell and Zihang Wang. And they did a um, very nice paper. They did very nice work on pre-trained models as well, removing weights uh, with a nice um, um, differentiable uh, L0 pruning. Okay, they use uh, like a hard concrete distribution, which is basically the, the gumballs of max trick. Okay. Um, and the last part is actually layer pruning. In layer pruning, this is a nice paper by Angela Fan of last year at Facebook as well. Um, they actually remove full layers of the transformer. So this is, this is really a lot, okay? You remove this, this full layer. So uh, the way you can actually do that and uh, have the model still behave quite well is by training the model to be resilient to that. So during pre-training, you will uh, randomly remove weights, remove layers, sorry, like a dropout, okay? It's a structured dropout, you drop layers. And so the model learns to actually behave well without some weights. It works well because uh, these transformers layer, they are like a repetition of the same module, okay? And you have this residual connection, this shortcut connection, which means that actually one layer and the next one, 
They are kind of they are always connected with a shortcut as well. So when you remove a layer, it's actually less uh, aggressive than in some like fully connected models without shortcut connection. So layer pruning is very interesting as well, and you keep these dense matrices because you remove full blocks of weight. So uh, why am I talking about this problem of sparsity? Well, because all these models, we run them on GPUs. And GPUs are, uh, or, or GPUs, but GPUs and GPUs, they are really optimized for dense matrix multiplication. Okay, They have troubles with sparsity. And when you use uh, this sparse model on GPU, on GPU or TPU, they are usually way slower. They can be like three to four times slower to run. So they're smaller indeed, but they're also lots, a lot um, slower. And it's also not efficient. So you're losing what you were actually looking for, which was energy efficiency. So there are various ways you can try to circumvent this. Uh, one way is to use what um, OpenAI was promoting, which is block sparsity. So instead of removing all these weights, uh, single weights, you actually remove blocks of weights. And these blocks have the nice uh, size that is uh, adapted to your uh, GPU or TPU kernel, which means that you keep dense matrix multiplication. Well, you can remove blocks, but actually when you do like strong sparsity, it means you just keep blocks actually, okay? Your matrix is just a few blocks as you can see here. So this helps you. Um, the, another approach is actually to make a full sparsity, but with patterns that you actually control. So you can uh, keep advantages of um, uh, optimized CUDA kernel. Now, the more you structure your sparsity, usually the less performances you can get because you're actually constraining the model. Okay. So if you have like unstructured sparsity, you usually can keep the best performances on, uh, on the metrics, but you lose the efficiency. And the more you structure the sparsity, the better your, your energy efficiency is and usually the worse your performance is. So another alternative is to actually switch chips and try, for instance, the new IPU from GraphCore, which are chips that are specifically designed for sparse models. Okay, they are made of a lot of small modules that can uh, process data independently and have this uh, small RAM associated to them. And they can uh, actually process sparse matrices very efficiently. Now, the last technique I want to talk about when we talk about strict shrinking model is quantization. Quantization is also very interesting. We know that uh, using float 32, using full precision uh, float uh, weights is actually not the most optimal way. We know that these uh, neural networks, they also work well with half precision and even uh, quantized integer. So we can do that from our transformers as well. Okay, we convert the flow to full 30 to the full precision weights into integer eight. So we really reduce a lot the size of our model. And we use dynamic quantization, for instance, where you have um, a scaling and zero points conversion. And this works very well. There was a nice uh, work by Intel uh, uh, called Q8 Bird, and it's really working well. You can try it. It's very easy in PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow as well. It's very easy to apply quantization. And a bit like layer pruning, you can do training aware quantization. So you kind of tell your model is going to be quantized at the end. Okay, you actually train it in a way that it's getting used to be quantized. And so you have uh, better performances as, as well at the end. Okay. 